So a lot has changed on this channel recently, but one thing that hasn't changed is my hardcore adherence to the rules of Patreon. And the rules state that people above a certain tier get a question answered in a lightning round video. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Here we go. Isaac Hutchison asked, I've just learned that Io generates an electrical current by proxy of Jupiter, if I remember correctly. Could humans theoretically harness said current? Could that be one of the steps to becoming a type two civilization? Damn it, Isaac, you had to send me down a rabbit hole. Io is a super weird moon, and I kept getting distracted from your original question because uh, the more I looked into it, the more I just kept coming across more and more weird stuff about this place. So just a quick uh, answer to your question about whether or not we could harness this current in the first place. I don't know. Um, I couldn't find a good answer for that because I had trouble finding out exactly how this current was made. But I think it has to do with these um, loops of plasma that exist between Io and Jupiter, which I'm clearly gonna have to step back a little bit to explain. Okay, so Io is about the same size as our moon. It has about the same orbital diameter, but whereas our moon orbits the Earth every four weeks or so, Io orbits Jupiter every 42 hours. So, yeah, Io's booking it. And that's because Jupiter is so massive and its gravity is so strong that the orbital velocity for Io has to be that much faster in order for it to, you know, not fall in. And all that gravity takes a toll on Io because its orbit isn't perfectly round. It's actually slightly elongated due to uh, interactions with Europa. Europa. So this means that tidal forces are constantly warping the planet as it moves closer and further away from Jupiter in its orbit. Um, its equator can actually bulge up to 300 kilometers every 12 hours. All this bending and stretching constantly over thousands, millions of years pretty much melted Io's inside, so it's full of molten rock and metals. At the same time, it weakens its surface, and that, kids, is how you get volcanoes. Lots and lots of volcanoes. There are over a hundred active volcanoes on Io, and at least a dozen or so are spewing out lava and gases at any given time, including this bad boy, which in no way looks like an anus. It's literally the most volcanically active object in the solar system, and all these volcanoes spew a lot of gases into the air, creating a very thin atmosphere. So, keeping all that in mind, another side effect of being so close to Jupiter is that it's caught in Jupiter's massive magnetic field. Um, it's the most massive planet in the solar system, so it has by far the strongest magnetic field. So this field passes through Io, and this is where it picks up that thin atmosphere I was just talking about. And it starts accelerating particles, charged particles out of this atmosphere from the poles of Jupiter, and then back to Io again in these loops of plasma. And every time Io orbits around the planet, we can actually detect the electromagnetic signal that comes off of that plasma loop. And because it happens in a regular cadence, that makes Jupiter technically a pulsar. So normally when you think of pulsars, you think of neutron stars that are spinning really fast and their poles are flinging jets of energy out in these regular pulses that we can detect. Uh, but technically any object that creates a steady repeating signal is a pulsar. So there you go. We have a pulsar in our solar system. But anyway, I, I think that the electric currents that you're talking about have to do with that plasma, which again, I'm not sure how we would capture that energy, but I did look it up and I saw that it generates about 400,000 volts and 3 million amps. So just for reference, I looked up how many volts come out of the Hoover Dam, and that's 250,000 volts. So Io would be a little less than two Hoover Dams. And the Hoover Dam provides power for 1.3 million people. So, I mean, I suppose in theory, that sounds pretty good. Tapping into Io might make it possible to, you know, provide two million or so people with power to help colonize space. Of course, you wouldn't be able to capture all that electricity. Again, I don't know how capturing it would work, some kind of induction maybe, but you would have to imagine there would be some losses in that. And then you'd have to get that power out to where people could use it. Um, I imagine you'd need to send it over microwaves or something like that, which there'll be a lot of losses there too. Not to mention it rotates around Jupiter so fast, so you wouldn't be able to just directly send a continuous beam of energy somewhere. Uh, you might have to bounce it around from one energy station to another, kind of like make a constellation out there. That would mean even more losses. Now, one thing I do know is that there won't be any people actually working on IO to collect this. Those charged particle beams, um, they're massively radioactive. Yeah, IO gets blasted with five times a lethal dose of radiation every day. So imagine if this were even a thing, um, we would have to have some kind of autonomous systems out there and robots to, to, to generate this energy. So maybe we won't be the ones mining the electricity off of IO. Maybe our future robot overlords will. That was a good question. That was fun. Thank you for that one. Chromatic Pick on Discord asked, I wanted to say I like the small changes you've made in your channel. The small changes are appreciated. My question is, 
What are you most excited about with your new studio setup that's in the works? I think what I'm most excited about is just being done with it. <laughs> this was a lot. And I'm still not completely done with it. There's still some glitches in the setup and everything that are, are just kind of band-aided over right now. I'm excited about my new wall unit over here. I haven't like filled it with stuff yet, so I still have a lot of organizing to do in here, but um, I love the idea of having an actual second work area, so I'm not always using this space. So that this can be like my shooting space and that can be my workspace. I'm excited that we're shooting in 4K now. Um, now to be clear, we're not exporting in 4K, but with the extra size, we can kind of zoom in and out. You might've noticed us doing that in the last few videos, but that just kind of gives us a, so a little more room to do more fun things. I'm also excited that I'm using a boom mic now instead of having to worry about the, the lavalier mics all the time. Um, there were always issues with the batteries running out. Sometimes there were connection issues and pops and stuff. That was like a long running plague on the channel. Um, I just, just not having to deal with putting on the thing every single time is just one less step to getting in here and recording stuff and, and I like it. I'm not thrilled with how hot it's getting in here. Um, these new lights are not very cool. Um, it warms up pretty quickly. I'm pretty sweaty right now and it was already pretty bad. So I'm gonna need a solution for that. Um, I was considering getting a mini split for this specific room and I may just have to do that. But I think mostly I'm just excited about, you know, uh, making a change and, and trying new things. Um, I think so far the response has been good from you guys and I really appreciate it. But uh, for me, it's just, you know, you do anything for seven years, it's always good to, to try something new. And, and this has kind of been a little bit of a spark to do all kinds of new things on the channel. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to be getting started on it and I hope you guys like it. We need a name for the plant. I actually have a weirdly emotional connection to this plant. We've had it forever and it used to just kind of like be in a bowl downstairs. Um, I think I've had this plant at least five years and um, now it's part of my set and I like it, but maybe it needs a name. Give me a name. John, also known as Right Handed Neutrino, asked, what's the chance that YouTube creators would make technical mistakes on purpose to generate commenting activity? I've noticed a few channels make very obvious mistakes like saying kilometers per hour when referring to distance or million when they clearly meant billion. My first thought was to check the comments for a correction, but then I realized I might be getting played. Is there any truth to this hunch? I mean, I can't speak for every other creator. I can just, I can honestly say I've never done that. Um, believe me, when I screw up, it is because I am dumb. So if you ever watch one of my videos and you catch yourself saying, is he really that stupid? The answer is yes. Now, it wouldn't surprise me um, there's always somebody that's trying to gain the system out there. Like I know whenever I say something controversial uh, or it angers a lot of people and I tell other creators, the response is almost always, hey, engagement's good for the algorithm. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's possible. I mean, people do think that way. But I would like to also ask you to avoid the trap of thinking that everything a creator does is, you know, nefarious or scammy and that they're trying to trick you. I mean, we're, we're all just slaves to the algorithm here. We're all just trying to, to run a business and pay our teams and stuff like that. Um, and we, we've got to sort of play that game, the algorithm game to stand out from all the noise. Like I started A-B testing thumbnails after a video goes out if it's not doing very well. And I know that a lot of people don't like that and they think that it's some kind of trick. Like I'm, I'm trying to get them to watch the video for a second time or something like that. And I'm just like, no, I, I just want to be able to pay my team, you know? Now there is a kind of clickbait that I've been seeing way too often lately where they basically post a headline in a thumbnail that cannot possibly be true. And it makes you want to click on it just to see how full of shit these people actually are. It's like the thought process is like, there, there's no way he's actually saying that. I need to watch this so I can see how much this guy's lying in his thumbnail, you know? Um, it's like, you know you're being tricked, but you click on it because you, you want to see how badly you're being tricked. That is a thing that happens a lot. It's disgusting and I hate it. Megan asks, ChatGPT has become very popular with the tech industry as it's enormously helpful for complicated questions. So I cannot fathom why schools are banning it. What do you think of the repercussions from having a potentially highly functional AI like ChatGPT as a search assistant? Where are the downsides? You um, really can't fathom why an English teacher wouldn't want their students using this? Um, this is actually an interesting conversation though, because my wife is an English teacher, in case you didn't know that. And uh, we had this conversation the other day because we both agree that um, these new AI tools are becoming, they're gonna become so prevalent in the next five years that by the time her students get out of college, if they don't know how to use these tools, they will be legitimately behind the rest of the world. So, you know, they, they need to be learning these things, but at the same time, 
uh, they, it kind of conflicts with the traditional things that they've always had to learn. I mean, I've done this in a video before where I talked about the future of education. It's, it's a really interesting time to be an educator right now uh, because technology has basically made it so that you don't really have to know things anymore, like the facts and figures and stuff like that. It's all available. It's in your pocket wherever you want it, whenever, wherever you go. And um, I mean, that's been true for a while. And now you don't even have to do the research. You can just, you know, ask your phone the question and it'll spit out the answer customized for, you know, whatever use you have. And by the way, they're already talking about GPT-4 that's already out um, and being tested and whatnot. It's supposed to be way more powerful. Uh, there's gonna be even more advancements in the future. I mean, how long did it take to go from GPT-3 to GPT-4? I think we're pretty much gonna see a shift in the thinking of what gets prioritized in schools going forward. You know, teachers will work with these AI programs that teach lessons that focus on problem solving, creative solutions over fact learning and stuff like that. Um, I know I'm slipping into Jostradamus territory right now. And I'm kind of behind on the on the chat GPT stuff myself, if I'm being honest. I mean, I've, kind of, I've used it to help kind of come up with ideas for uh, uh, titles and thumbnails and stuff like that. Um, but I will say, in the little amount that I have used it, I don't trust it yet. Um, perfect example, I did a video on smart cities a little while back, and I asked it to just write me a few paragraphs on uh, this planned community called Telosa that's uh, being planned for Arizona. Planned, it's it's not, nothing's been done yet, it's all just in the drawing board stage right now. But ChatGPT came back with this long history of the place, and there's like a million people that live there, and here are the attractions you should see. I mean, it just, it just constructed this entire history of a fake town. So I am a bit concerned about uh, the increasing spread, exponentially increasing spread of misinformation in the world that could come because of this stuff. I know that GPT-4 is supposed to be better about that than GPT-3 was. I really need to do a video about this topic. It's becoming a really big deal. Like even the people who are, um, on board with this and are really like in the know on this, I think even they are under appreciating what a shift this is becoming and it's gonna happen really fast. So there's gonna be more to be talked about here. And Brian Beswick asked, with seemingly renewed interest in Venus and theories of an upper atmosphere boundary suitable for habitation, do you think NASA will plan missions to it given its relative closeness compared to Mars? How long until we have a cloud city, Lando? I really wanna see this happen. I mean, to, to do like a cloud city thing, we would have to have some kind of massive automated construction infrastructure. Um, I don't know, might have to mine an asteroid or two. But the idea of balloons in Venus's atmosphere is not too far-fetched. And by the way, combines both space travel and airships. Two things I love. Actually, just last year, JPL uh, conducted a few tests with a prototype Venus balloon, um, and it passed them all. They call it an aerobot. And it's kind of a balloon inside of a balloon with a helium reservoir that can compress it down when you need to go lower, expand it when the balloon needs to rise. It's made out of a special material since Venus's clouds contain sulfuric acid, um, and it's expected it could float around an altitude of 55 kilometers above the surface for months at a time. Which, by the way, the Soviets did this a while back in 1984 with their Vega missions, uh, but it only lasted like 48 hours. But that was way longer than the lander lasted on those missions. Now your question didn't denote whether you meant crewed or uncrewed missions. Of course, if you're talking Cloud City, that would be very crude, but um, I'm gonna assume it'll be a while before we could do any crewed balloon missions. Um, that's just a type of exploration we've never done before. But I do think we could see balloon missions to Venus in the next 10 years. Um, NASA actually has two missions planned called Da Vinci and Veritas going up in 2027, 2029. Uh, they're both just orbiters though. But I know the Rocket Lab has been showing an interest in Venus missions, so maybe it'll be a private company that leads the way. Either way, I, I wanna see it happen. Did you know that next week's video is already live on Nebula? I've always posted early on Nebula, but it was usually only a few times, but since we came back from our little break, I'm posting a week early now, so next week's video is already up. And actually, it's been up for a few days. So all the questions in today's video came from Patreon supporters. Patreon's a great way to support the channel, but another great way is to sign up for Nebula. Nebula is creator-owned, meaning we all have a stake in its success, and the more people who sign up, the more we all benefit. So it's, it's like Patreon, but instead of just supporting one person, you're supporting a whole bunch of people. And in return, you don't just get access to my exclusive videos, you get exclusive videos from over 150 awesome creators, including Johnny Harris, Windover Productions, Real Life Lore, Not Just Bikes, who I just interviewed on my podcast recently. You get to see all of our videos ad-free and early, and yeah, you get access to exclusive content like my Forgotten Atrocities series and my Mysteries of the Human Body series. 
Plus now there's Nebula Classes, which takes you behind the scenes to learn how some of the biggest creators on YouTube create their content, do their research, and share their skills with you. And you can get access to all of that when you go to nebula.tv slash Joe Scott, and you can get it for 40% off the annual plan, which comes out to about $250 a month. So really, if you like my channel, Nebula is just like a curated streaming service of other creators that you'll like just as much. So go check it out. It's nebula.tv slash Joe Scott. Links down in the description. Big thanks to the Patreon supporters and channel members that help keep the lights on around here. They're forming an awesome community. I cannot thank you guys enough. Got some new members to shout out real quick. We got Venelin Kor Kovachev, Diana Cortez, Space NM, <laughs> Justin Y with mustache access, interesting, Munahito Moro, jo Joseph Davis, Nick, Alice Leva, Anton Novikov, Mark Trout, and Nickel Jackson. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, you get early access to videos, you get exclusive live stream access, and you get a little thing next to your face, your little your name down in the comments. Makes you stand out, makes you more interesting. Um, just hit the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And hey, if you wanna see more of what I've done, just kinda of look at the sidebar or anywhere that they share the stuff on YouTube. Any thumbnail, it's got my little blue face on it. Give it a click. And if you like it, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.